Okay, well, this is a little bit of a different setup this time. Welcome to the, today's episode of That IT Show podcast. Uh, and in today's episode, we are going to be discussing something completely out of the ordinary for our podcast, which is more related to hardware, but in a practical sense. So specifically, we are going to be discussing uh, a RISC-V development board. I have a set of them as I bought them a couple of months ago for some of the things related to my PhD research. Today, I want to assemble a RISC-V based system. We're going to talk about uh, OSs that we can deploy on top of them, uh, these systems. And then we're going to uh, go through the process of installing them and using this platform for, let's say, desktop work, because uh, realistically speaking, that's where RISC-V is right now. But without further ado, yeah, this is That IT Show Podcast. Welcome to a new episode, and we'll be right back after the intro. Okay, welcome to a little bit of a change studio today uh, with loads of cameras around. I'm completely baffled by the setup because it's the first time that uh, we're doing it this way. Yasmin is away on vacation and I promised him that I'm going to do a couple of episodes while he is away, although we do have more than a few of them in our YouTube studio buffer. But uh, recently I had much more time to spend with this platform. And the experiences are still fresh. I wrote about them in some of the papers that I'm publishing right now as a part of the um, PhD research that I'm doing. But uh, uh, this episode is meant to do something else, which is to describe the validity of the idea of using RISC-V platform for something, whatever that something might be, and to see how that stacks up against, let's say, other platforms that are currently available on the market, be it Intel's or perhaps even ARM's, because there are quite a few ARM-based platforms that we can use as well. We recently also received a first, um, uh, uh, the Snapdragon Elite-based laptop. I've been using it for the past month or so, so we're going to be talking about that one in some other episode. But for the time being, let me describe what we have here on the desk today and then we're going to slowly but surely move to the idea of assembling this PC. Uh, then I'm going to again switch studios and do a little bit of a screen recording for uh, deploying of the deployment of the operating system because that is a little bit different to what you might be used to at least for the time being. And then we can uh, just play around and see how this thing performs. Okay, uh, specifically on this camera that I'm right now using here, I have a Sci-5 Hi-5 unmatched motherboard with a corresponding chipset and the CPU. The, the CPU is based on the RISC-V architecture, and this is one of the first commercially available, mostly let's call it a development board, let's not call it a uh, some kind of a um, production ready something, although you could do it. I have one of these boards in the data center. It's been running there for five or six months without any problems. So it's not about the idea of necessarily stability or something like that. It's just that this is the first glimpse into the RISC-V architecture in practice that everybody can get a hold of. Um, we are stationed in Europe, so uh, if you go to Mauser's web shop, there are, uh, there are these kinds of setups available. And actually, they recently dropped in price heavily. This motherboard with 16 megabytes of RAM integrated uh, and the RISC-V CPU, which is uh, soldered on the motherboard, is something like 260, 70 you know, euros, plus minus a couple of euros. And we're going to determine whether or not that's actually worthwhile, uh, the investment of time and money uh, into using this platform. Sci-5 has been a a corporate entity that's been around, so it's been around the block for more than a few years now. And um, although I tried to contact them when I started my uh, my PhD research, they were not necessarily very talkative. So I just took my own money out of my own pocket and bought three of these motherboards. 
Uh, the two of them um, arrived in our studio two weeks ago and I had a chance to play with the first one, as I said, for more than a few months now. And I've gotten a really good glimpse into or a feeling of how how they uh, how these things perform and what they could be used for. And at the end of the video, I'm going to be comparing them to some other let's say newish architectures and platforms that you might acquire in the similar price range or there or thereabouts. The idea of risk five is something that you can read about on uh, online heavily. There is a website of risk five uh, consortium available where you can uh, uh, read and find the documentation about the risk five instruction set architecture, which is meant to be a open source architecture for building CPUs. I know for a fact that there are many, many different, for example, universities around the world working on different types of designs, custom designs that I include RISC-V uh, RISC uh, course, and they are building additional accelerators on top of those cores. Uh, I'm actually starting to uh, be, be a part of a team that does that here locally as well. And there are many, many dozens and dozens of universities around the world they are doing these sorts of uh, the, this sort of work nowadays. The main difference between this one uh, as a platform and ARM as a platform, for those of you who are familiar with ARM platforms, apart from the mobile phones and whatnot, is the fact that ARM is something that's licensed, so there is money involved if you want to create your own custom core or custom chip, while RISC-V architecture is basically completely open source. And there are various pluses and in perhaps some negative sides to it, but um, generally speaking, it's a good effort by the worldwide community at the beginning to create something that is not necessarily just going to be for commercial purposes only. Now, with that being said, uh, this motherboard that we can see on the camera is very straightforward. It's like a mini ITX format, super easy to understand what this is all about. So it has a backplate, just like a regular PC motherboard, nothing different there. It has an um, uh, ATX power connector. It doesn't have an additional 12 volt, volt or two times 12 volt or EPS power connector as we used to, uh, as we uh, have on, let's say, PC motherboards. It does have two NVMe uh, slots for both the bigger and the smaller ones. We're gonna talk about the performance of, the, uh, of these slots a little bit later in the video as well couple of um, uh, connectors for uh, coolers, if you need them, although this platform doesn't heat, heat up all that much, so we don't necessarily see the point. And there is a front panel uh, connectivity available so that we can use our you know, reset buttons and power buttons and uh, LEDs for the disk and whatnot. Two really cool features of this motherboard, one of them I haven't seen in a, in a long, long time, since mid 2000s actually because they haven't been involved in that kind of work for a while the, the 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 cool feature is this usb port here which is actually a usb serial console uh, and with the motherboard you get a couple of extra goodies one of them being a usb serial uh, cable that you can hook up to your let's say pc and then you can uh, kind of like get the console view of what's happening uh, of what's happening uh, on your uh, risk 5 system based on this motherboard which is cool i haven't seen that in a while since you know the uh, graphic cardless servers of the mid 2000s although they were quite popular for a while because this chip uh, if you uh, or this motherboard if you look at it from this perspective you can clearly see that there is no hdmi connector or something like that but we do need some kind of a screen output so a serial console will do uh, we will hook that up to uh, uh, another computer, and then we're going to go through the motion of, you know, deploying basically Ubuntu Linux, which is, uh, re realistically speaking, the only thing that you might want to install on this. The second thing, uh, it has a built-in micro SD slot. For the most part, what you would use this one for is to uh, do initial deployment of Ubuntu system. And then there is a slightly, you know, roundabout or complex way of uh, actually making this boot from the NVMe disk. As I said, the booting procedure is somewhat different at this point in time, but generally speaking, I think it's going to end up looking exactly the same as uh, on your regular PC motherboard with a little bit of more development. 
because natively out of the box, the, there is no directly supported way to deploy the OS uh, on the uh, on the uh, NVMe disk. I'm using a Samsung 980 NVMe disk here with uh, 500 gigabytes, so it's, it should be plenty of disk space for whatever I might use this system uh, later for. There are some odd bits and pieces here uh, for those of you who are perhaps more in tune with Arduino boards or some ARM and Raspberry Pi boards. There are some, uh, you know, cool little niggly little details here that you could use to further customize the way in which this board, uh, these boards work. There are a couple of jumpers here and deep switches and whatnot. There are a couple of buttons to, uh, if you want to use this motherboard basically flat on the desk, you can just power it on via a button if you want to, but it freely supports, uh, you know, as it has the front panel connections, you can easily uh, boot it uh, or start it uh, from uh, the power button. The back panel, you know, nothing extra special here. Uh, wireless connectivity uh, is something that can be achieved via an additional module. It has, a, as I said, SD and console port. There is a Ethernet port available, and then maybe it's better to show it this way. There are there's a set of four USB uh, four USB ports available here, which you can use to hook up your you know mouses, keyboards, USB sticks, whatever that may be. A couple of months ago, I tried to use this motherboard uh, to hook up. You, you can clearly see the PCI Express slot here. I tried to hook up uh, both AMD and NVIDIA's uh, graphic cards here, but sadly they didn't work. And I tried like seven or eight different models. I'm not necessarily surprised. Uh, first and foremost, there are no drivers for them available right now, not, at least not that I could find. And also, furthermore, maybe they're not even supported by some uh, BIOS details that still need to be worked out. You, you never know with these early boards. Uh, there might be some things that need to be looked after uh, in the future as well. Nothing special on the other side of the board, just your regular mini ITX board. And the deployment process and installation process for this is just like assembling a PC, as you're going to see in a second. So I uh, took a liberty of preparing the necessary bits to do the, the whole deed. So I have a set of screws for the case that's uh, right next to me. I have four screws for the motherboard and I installed all of the necessary uh, uh, components so that these screws can be actually used. I have a screwdriver, so I'm just going to switch to the right hand side of my desk and we're going to do a full build out of this RISC-V system. Before that, I'm going to drink a little bit of, drink a little bit of chocolate because that's the liquid that, you know, young dudes not in shape need to drink a lot of. Okay, in terms of the case, absolutely nothing special. Just your regular, you know, PC-ATX case, thermal takes. It's seven or eight or nine years old, so it's really, really old. Then I have a old XFX power supply, which is like a huge overkill for this motherboard um, with the built-in components and whatnot. This motherboard has like five or six times uh, more power than it really, uh, than the motherboard actually requires. I have everything ready here, so let's do the installation first. Of course, let's put the backplate inside. And after that, we're going to move to installing the motherboard. You can clearly see how tiny this motherboard is right now. And it really is, it's one of the smallest motherboards that I have seen in a long, long time. Super easy to manipulate and use. Uh, the uh, only thing that required a little bit of, let's say, not being blind more than anything else. If you can see this orange bit on top of this screw hole that can be used to uh, screw in a smaller NVMe drive. This is actually a sticker. Uh, and you need to peel that off with your nail if you want to use it. Which, if you don't have any nails, you know, if you are biting them or something, might be a problem. So you have this orange sticker that you need to peel off. I had to do it here as well because, yeah, it's, it's on this slot too. And then, of course, you need to no, screw in the NVMe drive in, which 
pretty straightforward process there. Uh, if you uh, if you don't have the screws for that, they're easily available in your hardware stores and or online. Actually, Amazon has a stack of those too. Okay, let's now screw this in. It's very straightforward process, and then we're going to move on to a little bit more involved process, which is connecting all of these bits and pieces that need to be connected for this computer to work. Okay, screw number two, number three. Number four. So that's that. And then I do have an additional cooler. It's really an overkill for this motherboard and it's absolutely not necessary, but I'm going to connect it anyway so that it doesn't just sit sit around doing nothing. Of course, the uh, ATX power connector needs to be connected here. That's pretty straightforward. Just needs a little bit of force. And then we need to, of course, connect the, uh, the front panel connectors. Uh, there is a picture available on Sci-Fi's website and in the manual of the motherboard for this. Uh, so this should be pretty straightforward to find. I actually accessed this uh, URL recently. So I'm going to just try to find it from my history links on my phone. Let's see if I have it here somewhere. I think I do. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Product brief data sheet manual schematics. I actually have a camera shot, I think, of this part of the motherboard in my phone, or I deleted it already. Basically, what you can do, even without the manual, I could just take a shot of the lower right-hand side of the motherboard, because uh, the, the, the pins are labeled, so it's pretty easy to understand what, what you need to do. I'm going to put my phone here. So, let's see. Top left is HDD LED, so that's this one. Then below it is a reset switch, pretty straightforward as well. That's that. Then on the right hand side we have power LED, so these two. Be careful about the plus and the minus when assembling this, so that the, so that the LED actually works. And power switch is below this one. That's good. There we go. Pretty straightforward. Everything done here. I don't need any of these, you know, SATA, GPU, uh, floppy, CD, whatever, power connectors or any other connectivity for this motherboard, which actually uh, reminds me of something that should be mentioned here. If you take a look at the layout of the, of the motherboard and if you really look closely into the details of the motherboard, you're going to notice that there are no, you know, SATA ports or whatever available on this motherboard. The primary intention is to either boot from micro SD card or later on from NVMe. So there are people who will dislike this, of course, because, you know, there are a lot of people have SATA SSDs and perhaps those people would like to use it. But having in mind that this is an early board, uh, that's not necessarily the finished product uh, that, or let's say it's a finished product that's going to lead to development or more products in the future, we can let this one slide a little bit. With that being said, so everything is collected, believe it or not, and there is no need for us to connect anything else. Which means that we've reached the, uh, the end of the physical assembly process part. Now, I am a little bit uh, particular when it comes to assembly of these things, so don't mind my fake OCD. It's actually a real one when it, uh, when it comes to these things, but uh, mo 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 most people who know me would say that I don't have OCD because I'm as messy as, as you can be. But uh, I do have a problem with messy computers for some reason. You know, it is what it is. Each and every one of us is unique. I'm just going to wipe this a little bit. So it's not so that it's not as visibly dirty as it is right now. At the end of the day, it's going to look better on camera that way as well. Okay, that's done. This is not dirty at all. 
I actually wiped a part of this earlier, so it should be in good stead. And I'm also going to take, of course, this one. Yeah, this is might be a little bit too early to put this on, but I've assembled this specific system. I don't know how many times already because uh, again I've been using one of those for months exactly the same case and the power supply and the layout of the key uh, the keys on up front and and those front panel connectors so I'm pretty pretty certain that th this is going to work out of the box and I'm going to close this down as you should if nothing else for for dust reasons. That's that. And now the second part of my fake OCD is going to come into play again. You people who have a real OCD, I'm not mocking you. I'm just mocking myself, just so that we understand each other. These are just some wipes. Okay, this was actually pretty clean, which surprises me because this case has been sitting on the floor of our office for, I don't know, six, seven, eight months at least. Okay, so now our computer is done, completely assembled looking and sitting pretty for the camera, which is good. And we are actually going to move to the second part of the video now. And that part involves, as I mentioned earlier, installation of uh, Ubuntu Linux, which is supported on, on this system. Actually, you have a finished image for it, easily downloadable with one of the latest revisions of Ubuntu, which is very, very welcome. So that I don't have to, you know, do nasty things before uh, the OS is installed. Okay, we're now, now going to move to that part of the uh, of the video. Uh, I'm not going to be visible for that one uh, because that's going to be screen recorded. And afterwards we are coming back to the studio and doing some closing thoughts. Okay, let's now go through the uh, process of preparing the Ubuntu image to be booted on our RISC-V system. For that purpose, we need three things. First and foremost, the easiest method is to use the Raspberry Pi Imager, available from raspberrypi.com forward slash software. Then we need an actual image, which can be uh, read about on ubuntu.com. I'm going to post the links uh, in the description of the video so that you can find it more easily. And specifically in one of the Sorry, you got wrong link. Uh, on one of the uh, one of the available links, you're going to see uh, the availability of Ubuntu pre-installed server, Risk Five, Unleashed, Unmatched, depending on the Sci Five motherboard that you're using. There's actually something else to this. I'm going to go here and open this, and then I'm going to open. I think it's 2404. Power PC Risk Five. There we go. Server install image. We can actually find the Server Five uh, uh, Risk Five version of the server installation image as well that we can download. This is going to be an image in gazipped format and it's going to take a little bit of time to download. I'm mentioning this because of the fact that the URLs here are a little bit older, so 2104 for those of us who want to have the most recent version 2404 is available. I already took the liberty to download this 2404 version of the image and I have it ready to go. And the third component is of course the SD card uh, and the SD card reader that you're going to put the card in so that you can create the bootable SD card. So that's that. Download the image, uh, install the Raspberry uh, Pi imager and then we're going to burn that image to uh, to our SD card. So I'm going to start the imager. Then you select the custom, select the image that you want to write on the USB disk, 
or, or specifically on the SD card. I'm going to put it on my SD card here and just next, no, yes, and let it run. It's going to run for two or three more minutes. So I'm going to pause the video until this finishes. So after uh, the process is finished, the uh, Raspberry Pi imager is going to warn us that we have uh, a ready uh, SD card and to remove it from the reader, which is exactly what we've done. And now I'm going to put the SD card into the RISC-V uh, computer that we've shown in the video. And after that, I'm going to boot it, but I'm going to also hook up a console to the USB port, as I mentioned uh, in the video, so that I can see the system booting. Okay, the system has booted and I've connected the system to the network. The next step would probably be to do some updates and upgrades. Let's see how that works. Okay, let's use the date command to change the date. So that it's basically what the time is now. And let's see if the update update now starts working. Okay, much better. Yeah, this is the risk because I don't have the ability to enter BIOS and to set the clock on the motherboard level, so I had to do it this way. But now I'll be able to download necessary packages, set NTP, and even transfer the system clock to the hardware clock, which is in the, in the BIOS of the motherboard or on the motherboard. So let's wait for this process to finish. And then I'm going to install the necessary packages to use NTP and uh, for hardware clock as well. Okay, let's now do a little bit of the work that I mentioned. So we're going to install NTP. Let's see if that pulls through. Okay, let's try. Okay. This is going to take a little bit of time, so I'm going to pause the video now and come back when the upgrade process is finished. Okay, update finished after roughly half an hour or so, as expected, because it's a, a SD card, so those tend to be very slow. Now the reboot is starting, and after re the reboot we're going to check some things out related to performance. Specifically, there's one niggly little detail that I think you should know. Okay, let's continue and we are going to focus on one thing. As soon as I log in, of course. And that thing specifically is related to the NVMe performance. This is something that I noticed on my other board that I've had for uh, six months or so now, maybe a little bit less. And let's see if it's the same story uh, here. For that purpose, I'm just going to suit the root and I'm going to install one more package. Very straightforward procedure. I'm just going to see if HD Parm is installed. It is. Okay. Let's see. What is the device name of our NVMe drive? I'm just going to do a small test on this one. Let's see the results. The results were really bad on my other motherboard. Same SSD. A couple of hundred megabytes per second, perhaps. There we go, yet again. Let's see the buffered result even lower. Let's do it one more time just for, let's say, scientific reasons. Usually the second time is negligibly faster, but let's see. 
yeah, it's exactly the same here. This performance is very, very low, having in mind that we have a PCI Express slot basically for the M2. We have uh, SSD that is capable of delivering multiple gigabytes per second. So I don't know what the problem here is. Uh, it's definitely not a driver problem. This is something that either the uh, the uh, motherboard manufacturer or somebody who is you know doing the physical aspect of the design of the motherboard and CPU that's being used there, they need to solve this because this is just horrendously bad. But yeah, yeah, our system is now installed. We could use it. We could we could deploy packages on it. The only downside to this is if you want to learn stuff like Kubernetes, that's not going to work. There is no upstream Kubernetes on, on this platform for RISC-V, so we're going to just hang on uh, for a little bit longer until this potentially becomes available in the future. Okay, with that being said, so let's go back to the, uh, to the live video. Okay, now that we've gone through the process of deploying Linux on top of this, let's kind of uh, gather our thoughts, uh, describe what we went through, offer some, let's say, opinions, future work capabilities, maybe some insight into what needs to change on this platform and whatnot. So the first and foremost thing that we need to remember is these are just the early versions of the RISC-V platform, so looking into performance is probably not going to be our best bet. I mean, for running some kind of a, let's say, small desktop personal computer based around this motherboard, I'm guessing that this is a system that's more than capable of doing that. So uh, you could use this as a platform for that or to do a little bit of experimentation to learn and whatnot. One of the episodes that we are preparing right now is related to retro PC gaming. I have a sneaking suspicion that this, mod this motherboard and this platform is going to be for a lot of people who buy, who buy it. Very reminiscent of um, uh, Yasmin's and mine personal experience with early motherboards in the PC era when we were able to actually buy computers in pieces. So from, let's say, I don't know, 486 and Pentium generations onwards, because this will rec this is a, a very good product to do a little bit of, let's say, um, uh, enthusiastic approach to computing, let's call it that way. Maybe uh, it's more suitable to, it is suitable for quite a few different types of applications, but the lack of, GPU output and the drivers might be a little bit problematic. This platform could be uh, on, uh, actually, on the other hand, used very nicely to teach system engineers various types of skills because they would be kind of like forced to use a CLI mode in Linux without the capability to do uh, graphical user interface. I find that to be actually a positive side uh, in system engineering world because especially in production, uh, loads of different environments do not have graphical user environments, so you have to get along with the text uh, text mode, whether you like it or not. Furthermore, uh, I would say that this is a very good starting point product for uh, p younger people to get into the open source movement in a way. The CPU and the platform is basically open source. Uh, Linux that you run on top of it is open source and whatnot, this will probably encourage people to play a little bit more with the platform than they usually would. Maybe a little bit of experimentation, customization, and the platform itself is quite open for future development, being the, seeing that RISC-V is an open source CPU platform. And that's going to bring about the different types of customizations to what we have now. Uh, customizations that we've known for the past, I don't know, 30 years or so, we're more about take a different CPU, put it in the system, or buy a new motherboard, put a new motherboard and the CPU in the system, or change the graphic cards. We are not talking about this. The RISC-V being the uh, open platform means that uh, the people will develop different types of accelerators and registers that will be put on the die on RISC-V, which is a completely different approach to ac uh, achieving acceleration for a variety of different tasks that are suit suitable for today's computing. 
uh, for uh, the, the people among us who are like system integrator, uh, s system engineers, network engineers, if you're into security, if you're into edge related things, for example, you know, IoT, edge computing, whatnot, this is a very straightforward platform to use, although there are a couple of other ones that might be uh, even better for certain use cases. We will discuss this in a second. Um, so for uh, any kind of education, this system might be really good for a lot of different uh, use cases, whether that's programming or whether that's system engineering, doesn't really matter. The fact that it's mini ITX is something that I like a lot because that means that th even in this case, which is just a you know regular mini, mini tower or mid tower uh, case, that case is a big overkill for it. It's way too big for it. So what we could do is build the system into a uh, some kind of a mini ITX case which would then consume at least like five or six times less the space which means that it would be very uh, very economic for certain environments maybe even educational environments at the end of the day but in all honesty to kind of describe this platform from a market perspective we need to look into a couple of other details that are out there already we cannot ignore them we cannot deny them and we should be honest and st state them out loud I mentioned that this platform could be used for a variety of things related to, let's say, edge or maybe even security or, or whatnot. Personally, I've been playing with the Turing Pi platform for the past more than a year now, a year and a half. For those of you who haven't had a chance to use that platform, Turing Pi, uh, Turing Pi platforms are like motherboards that you can, um, uh, uh, that you can equip with four uh, systems, basically whole complete systems, and those can be based around various types of ARM-based uh, SOCs. For example, stuff like NVIDIA Jetson, or uh, there is a, uh, there, there are a couple of Turing-based modules that are really good, R RK1, for example. Uh, you can also, with an adapter, use a CM4 Compute Module 4 from Raspberry Pi as well in those systems and whatnot. But it's a small ITX motherboard product which has four slots for four systems, and those four systems are complete systems. That's a major difference to this, which is a single system, on the basically the same, uh, in, in the same size for the platform, Mini ITX board, uh, the first one and the second one. Uh, for that type of environment, seeing that the Turing Pies are ARM-based, they would definitely be more in tune with the idea of, for example, distributed computing, even some security-related stuff uh, would work better on that, much more performance, realistically speaking. We are not talking about the numbers and performance in this video because it's very difficult to determine. risk five performance, uh, most of the benchmarks do not work on risk five at all, or you cannot compile them. I did a little bit of uh, stress and Gs uh, for, the, for the purpose of just road testing. And yeah, the, 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 the platform performance is way below, uh, for example, Turing RK1 if if you're familiar with those and don't even get me started with x86 for those of you who want to compare it that way i don't think it's a fair comparison but still but the turing pi platform would probably be a better idea for any kind of distributed computing kubernetes based stuff uh, dockers it uh, was, in terms of the energy efficiency it is incredibly efficient that i don't know for those four systems that i have I have three of three systems with those four uh, nodes inside. They consume less than 120 watts with all four systems turned on, and you can easily deploy the Docker's, the Kubernetes of the world on, on top of them. This one uh, you can uh, you can do Docker. Kubernetes only version 116 and in binary form is currently supported. There is no upstream Kubernetes compatibility with the latest revisions 130, 131, whichever came out a couple of days ago last time. I checked. Also, in terms of some other platforms that might be out there, there will be people who are going to compare this to other ARM platforms. Uh, I think that, yeah, this would this would be a little bit of unfair comparison if you're using the uh, ARM Ampere products for comparison or whatever the name was of the Huawei uh, platform that has those uh, 128 core uh, ARM CPUs, can't remember from the uh, Queenling or whatever it was, uh, because those are, uh, are aimed at completely different, uh, uh, let's say, vertical markets for HPC and for cloud environments and whatnot. This, is, this isn't that. 
And there are uh, many core architectures that are being built for uh, on Risk Five. They will come out sometime in the future. We just don't know right now when that's going to be. So, in essence, who is this for? Now, it is difficult to say that this is a desktop platform because it's difficult to connect a GPU to it and use it. There are a couple of uh, supported GPUs. I think I saw that in the manual, but I didn't have any of them, so I couldn't try them. Uh, if you make that work, then yeah, it's a very solid, let's say, low-end desktop platform that you can use to run Linux on, surf the net, download, upload, listen to MP3s, whatever. It, in, that, uh, in those terms, yeah, it's, it's quite okay. I would personally rather have some kind of ARM-based system, and uh, for that purpose, for example, the latest generation of these Snapdragon Elites are way better than, than this, but they are also quite a bit more expensive. Realistically speaking, the motherboard plus CPU and built-in memory, so you don't have to buy memory, were in the area of 250 euros with shipping, which is way less than, let's say, an average uh, Snapdragon Elite X uh, laptop that costs roughly 1,500 euros, so it's four plus times more the price. The fair comparison would be Raspberry Pi, for example, in terms of that, the, the, the let's say, the more expensive ones although they are actually a little bit cheaper than this and they are much more, much more developed, that would be a fair, more, more fair comparison, especially the model 300 or 400 with the keyboard, whichever that was. Uh, I would say that in terms of performance, the Raspberry Pi in that, uh, of that generation is way, way faster than this. Uh, uh, the version, uh, the generation five of, of uh, Raspberry Pis, I, I still haven't had a chance to test them, but I'm sure they are going to be even faster. So. There's that, a lot of things to consider. But for pure, let's say, enthusiastic approach to play around with something, not spend too much money, if you have a case and a CPU lying around, uh, you know, collecting dust or whatnot, this is a cool, let's say, educational and for your own development type of project that you could do, which I think that a lot of people will like, especially from the, uh, let's say, more experienced IT community, the type of people, uh, Yasmin and myself inclu included, because we love these systems. We will we love to try them as much as possible, and as many of them as we have them, uh, as we have, we are never, never tired of playing around with them and, and testing them. Okay, so that was that for this episode. I hope you got some information about the RISC-V platform. Uh, this was an episode about the feasibility of using RISC-V uh, sci-fi sci based motherboard for uh, some computing needs. Uh, this was uh, a huge pleasure to make and it was quite interesting to do this in front of a camera in live setting, you know, to stream this and whatnot. First time in a long time that I've been doing this. Hopefully you liked it and we'll see each other in the next episode. Thank you and bye.